anyone on the panel talk about the disposal of water after they're done using it for growing? You know, we, we, um, we irrigate outside, our outside our growing areas mostly and is, is what we end up doing with it. I wish we were better at uh, reclaiming that and, and cleaning it again, but we're not there yet. Um, but we've, we've found a way that we've got outside, you know, our main business is in the greenhouse. Uh, and that's, that's what we focus on, but we do other things outside of the greenhouse, more for hobbies and local, local people in our little community and local restaurants there, so we, we use that water out there. And we're looking at innovative technologies for wastewater disposal because water is so precious, especially out here. So why not take advantage of the new quality of that water to determine whether or not you can recover other minerals? Um, we're working with a company right now that takes old mine tailings, reprocesses them, and is able to pull out even more precious minerals or metals um, associated with the old mine tailings that everybody else thought was trash, you know, a few years ago. Um, and taking a look at new minerals that people hadn't really looked at before. How many people here are familiar with vanadium? I mean, vanadium's used in, in battery re, um, work now. Plus, the governor's office is working together with IBM and DRI on a water resource, water, what is it, center of excellence for water. And one of the things they're looking at is how can we recover even more water and take a look at, at waste or materials that we traditionally thought of as waste products and reuse them. So something to consider is just turning things on its side and, and, and looking at alternative approaches to waste disposal. Maybe it's not waste, maybe it's something that's recyclable or reused. I, let me add just one thing. I, I think everybody probably knows, but I just want to point it out that, you know, we capture our water. Any of the runoff is recaptured and, and fed back into our system. So it's a closed loop system. Periodically, we, we clean those tanks out and restart. And that's the water I'm talking about that we use for outside irrigation. But we recapture everything, rebalance the nutrients and the pH, and then use it again. So, you know, in the, in the, in the grossest sense, I guess, is you know, what, what the water we use is, is the water the plants take up or what evaporates from, from the sun um, for a period of time, and then we, we eventually start over. And then, David, would you like to comment any on some of Howling's decisions to invest in new technologies, new technologies to manage utilities, uh, whether it be solar or cogen or? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, certainly within this within this space, the uh, there are the key driving factor uh, is is cost. So, how can we reduce our cost and continue to produce a a great product? Uh, I'm very fortunate to work for. Howlings and, and, a, and a man in Casey Howling who, who has uh, invested in technologies that allow us to be um, not only more efficient but a, but a better citizen uh, globally when, when you look at it. So uh, our facility in Camarillo has a, a five acre uh, PV solar array. Uh, we, use, we use that on site. We're able to mitigate our, um, our electricity electricity consumption, and then more recently, uh, this past August, we unveiled a, a CHP project, so combined heat and power cogeneration unit, uh, two units specifically, um, that for us, we, we get the, the benefit of generating electricity. We're able to supply that electricity to the grid, or I should say we will be able to supply that electricity to the grid. The, uh, the, the challenges we've had in executing the project from a, from a bureaucratic perspective are, are great, but uh, we, we see a finish line and are very excited about that. Uh, but really, you look at a, at a combustion power plant, and, and that's what these are. They're small power plants, uh, 4.3 megawatts of, of uh, electrical energy in each, uh, each it's a GE Gen Bacher product very uh, um, very plentiful in Holland, the, the mecca of greenhouse. And we can, we can capture the waste heat and uh, waste exhaust gas. Um, the heat we store in million gallon tanks on our facility that allow us to, uh, at, a, at a later time, heat the greenhouse when required. And our, the, the exhaust gas goes through a catalytic converter process which cleans it up to food grade, uh, food grade level CO2, which is a, 
a significant input for for our farm. So uh, we've we've now taken have the ability to take these semi trailers of uh, liquid CO2 off the road and produce it on site with essentially what would be what would be a, a waste product. It's uh, it's a pretty cool project. The um, when you factor in the the thermal energy, the electrical energy the CO2 that you're able to pull out and even to the point where the, the water vapor from the combustion process we're able to capture and it's about 9,500 gallons of, of water a day that one of these, um, uh, one of these engines can, can produce, it, it operates at close to if not more than 100% efficiency and, and any academics in the room will say well there's, there is no way you can be over 100% and uh, it's, 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 it's quite an interesting conversation. It's beyond my, my scope and ability to, uh, to uh, discuss and debate, but the, the outputs that we take from it and what is traditionally a waste product that we're able to put back into our operation allows us to be close to 100% uh, efficient from the, from the input of natural gas to what we pull out of it. So that would lead us to the next part of the discussion, which would talk about growing a quality crop and how that goes all the way down the channel to selling a high quality crop. Um, this is for anybody on the panel who wants to take it. What sort of planning steps do you take in producing a high quality crop and then making sure that you have the right product assortment to go to the market with it? I'll, I'll jump back in there. and. I that this is the the biggest challenge in the industry that that we're in and you can you can do everything right you can have your steps in place and your planning to grow a high quality crop and and there are times that mother nature which continues to be our our number one input as far as sunlight temperature weather humidity all of those aspects uh, you know the benefit of, of growing indoors is the ability to to manage and control that, but you, you do not have 100% control. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the, you, you need to have that all, all together. Uh, at the same time, you need to have your, your customers lined up, but you can't 100% of the time do that. That's where relationships really come into play and proactive management to be able to talk to your customers and let them know what's coming down the line and, and what you're seeing. And, uh, we have the ability w w within the greenhouse to, to to forward look and see where where problems are going to occur and um, manage our business accordingly. Daryl, you want to take a shot? Yeah, I, I guess I would add to that that you know I came at this from a food aspect. I'm I'm not a farmer. Uh, I was like I said I was in the high tech business and and brought my clean room kind of background to the to the greenhouse. Um, as a food guy. You know, it's it's easy to get caught up into wanting to supply everything for everybody, and boy, that's a that's a big mistake. So you know, there's all kinds of systems out there, all kinds of dials and knobs you can turn to to fine tune a process for a specific set of crops. Um, you know, I think you 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 find the system or create the system as we did in some cases that that works best for us set of crops, and then try to figure out what matches those inputs well, as opposed to um, introducing a whole lot of cool, neat products that you want to have and you want to sell, but make sure everything fits within the parameters that your greenhouse is fine tuned to. You know, I know Ken's going to be giving you a discussion a little bit later, but Ken Kessick over here with Hydro Greens. I thought came up with a brilliant idea because one of the things we constantly try to do with companies that are in the county, especially if they're used to producing a natural resource, maybe it's a, a mineral or maybe it's a product or a, a, say a tomato or a, a basil or whatever. Um, I thought one of the brilliant things that he had was let's take that, that product a little bit further and do some manufacturing of a, a, a thing, you know, a, in this case, pesto or tomato soup or whatever. So if you don't have the ideal tomato available to sell out on the market, you just process that a little bit, put it into a new product, and there you go. You're still selling it and maybe even adding the dollar value to that product. And I think that's something that people really should take a look at is an innovative approach to what was so life hands you lemons, let's figure out how to make it a little bit more profitable for you and for your clients. Hey, we don't have a great crop this time, but look at what we got instead. We can provide you as an alternative. 
So, so far we really kind of, really touching on commercial greenhouse hydroponics with, with the panel that we have here. And we're looking at, in a way, traditional production of crops in a controlled environment uh, facility. Does anybody want to touch on some of the new trends, whether that be vertical farming or completely controlled environments, aquaponics? Anybody want to touch on those? Well, I can take a little stab. I've been, as Chris knows, tinkering with the uh, uh, vertical farms and LED lighting and different kinds of lighting for several years now. Um, the question before, I think, was, uh, was more of how do you choose a crop? You know, the, and again, going back to my high tech days, bringing process control into the greenhouse is what we did and what we did well and what made us successful. The um, lighting technology was kind of the, the missing link for so many years of why we couldn't completely control the environment. I think everybody said that, you know, we're still relying on Mother Nature in so many places. We're getting closer and closer to being able to um, really have a completely controlled environment where we're, you know, I think it was Paul put it up earlier, the, the temperature and the, the light and, and, you know, the, everything needs to be balanced. And so there's, there's um, you know, we're, we're good at that. We, we, we're getting much better. We've got all the sensors. Um, we've got all the measurement tools now that, that enable us to, to do that. It's being able to afford um, the energy cost and some of the other things that, um, that are preventing us from being, uh, I think, completely... Uh, enabling us to be completely controlled environment in most cases. Uh, there's still time, there's places that it makes a lot of sense, but you know, as, as long as that sun's free and, and plentiful like it is where I'm at, then that's still the most cost beneficial way to go. And, and when you introduce that, you introduce some variability. You know, you've, we're still dependent on the weather. Um, you know, cloudy days, you know, week long rainstorms that we have, you know, we're still, we're, we're still dependent on that there. As we move into controlled environment, we can really, um, uh, maybe I'm rambling at this point, but we can really, we can really measure those things and really get a, a tight control on all those things where we can produce consistent, beautiful, tasty crops, you know, time after time after time, even more so than we do today. David, do you have anything to add? Um, I, you know, I, I, I think again, it's, uh, where, where we're going and, and where the future of this industry is, is to take all of those variables out of, out of the equation and, and they will, um, you know, sp specifically at, at, at Howling's in our, uh, our Canadian facility, we, we invested in grow lights for winter production. Um, uh, the, the, the British Columbia environment allows for more or less a, a a March to November season, and uh, how do we how do we keep our business going? So, uh, you know, at, at a small scale, we put uh, we put lights in, and we're able to produce over the winter. So, that that took out that environmental variable. Now, it's uh, and and Daryl just commented on it, it. There there is a significant cost to that. Um, how do we how do we balance that? And and for us, it. It's looking at our, our product on a 12-month basis. So we, we have customers, they want locally grown product and, and consumers want locally grown product that continues to be uh, a driving force within this industry and, and within retail outlets. Um, so while we, we have, a, have an increased cost, and yes, we get a, an increased value during the winter time to supply our, our local BC community with with locally grown product, it, it it's not without uh, uh, trying to find the delicate way to say it. It it, it costs. It costs us a it costs us a lot. Uh, but by looking at our our business on a twelve month to year basis, we can say, okay, we we've got a buyer who in the winter time has uh, one maybe you know being ourselves maybe two suppliers. Uh, that can provide that BC grown product that their consumers want. Uh, we're producing that in those in those months when our competitors are not. And uh, as a result, uh, buyers like everybody, they want their life to be easy. There's there's <laughs> the uh, the hours in the day remain at 24. 
regardless of what we try and do in daylight savings, we, you know, we can we can take an hour off the front and sew it onto the bottom. We still have a 24-hour day, but um, we, we're trying to find ways to say to those those buyers, okay, you've you've got us in December, January, February, and when our uh, from a, from an industry perspective, when people are coming on in March and April, they're already buying from us. They've they've been sending us weekly POs or buy, you know two POs a week through those months. Uh, that's where the value is because come March, when when everyone else is coming up with with product, th they want their life to be easy. They want to keep sending the PO to the same person they've been dealing with for the last three months. So, uh, to and. To use your words, Daryl, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but the the whole the the point or the, the crux of what I'm trying to convey here is it's it's a year long business. If we can su supply people 12 months of the year, and and yes, we've we've got that added cost for three four months of the year, but let's look at it from a from a full perspective and, and understand what is the value we're driving when we are able to rely on Mother Nature and the sunlight and, and the, the daylight to produce our crops um, in, in investing during, during the times when it's short. It's a great thing when the capital's available. It's not so much when, when it's not. So we're getting to the question uh, and answer part of the, uh, the, this panel discussion, is there any closing, before we get to the questions, is there anything else you guys want to close with? Um. Again, all I'll do is stress that if you work with people who are local, who have already been there for a while, they'll probably have a lot of the information you're looking for. Um, in Nevada, the regional economic development authorities and people like Bonnie Lind and the, the industry specialists the governor invested in are there to help. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people don't take advantage of the programs that are readily available for free. So. It's, it's and I, just to add on that. I, I wish you'd have been there when I was starting. I, you know, it's it's to me, it's a it's a worthwhile investment. When we start a business, we're good at certain things, um, and we we dwell on those strengths, and we miss a lot of this stuff. You know, I'm a, not a very outgoing person, so I, I tend not to look outside of my box very often. But it's it's a worthy investment to me at this point to bring on somebody that does possess those strengths to go dig those things out and uh, take advantage of those things because they're, they're uh, remarkable uh, uh, things to, to have. <laughs> so let's move to the question and answer session. And uh, as before, we'll use the two mics on the side. And uh, it's a race to the mics. We'll start over here. <laughs> <clears throat> hey, um, this question is for David Bell specifically or any of the panelists who have an opinion and want to chime in. Um, you mentioned a lot of reasons why chefs and consumers want to buy your product, but have you received any indication that either the chefs or the end, you, the end consumer prefer the taste of in-ground in -ground tomatoes as opposed to hydroponic? Um, well, we, we, I feel very fortunate. I, I receive either emails or phone calls every day from end consumers who have bought our, bought our product, and, and I mean, the, cr the crux of what they're saying is thank you. Thank you for providing a product that tastes like a tomato. And, and I mean, it's so unfortunate that the, um, the reality in, in the land of the consumer is, is that the flavor has, has left. Or when I say has left, I say it, it left. It's coming back. And, and uh, the ability to harvest vine-ripe product uh, allows that flavor to be delivered back to the consumer. And it's... A week doesn't go by that I don't receive two or three uh, communications um, that that say this reminds me of what my grandfather used to grow, or this this remind you know my tomatoes aren't doing well this year, but man I've, I haven't experienced that uh, outside of my own garden. And thank you, it, it, it's very rewarding to uh, to see the effort people will make to just to say just to reach out to you to to let you know that they love the product that you're putting out in the marketplace. We have the same thing. I mean, it's, if, if you can get the, there is sometimes difficulty overcoming people's perceptions of what, oh, you're, you're you know, doing mad science to create my food. I'm not interested in that. Well, no, we're not. I mean, we, but um, if you can get them to taste it and actually listen for five minutes of, of what you're doing and why it's better, 
but get them to taste it. It's, it's without a doubt, you know, a, a tastier, more consistent flavor than, than you're gonna get elsewhere. Tomatoes, historically, have had a bad rap, greenhouse grown, but uh, when done properly, there's no better tasting tomato in the world. I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're great. And so it's just getting people to taste them and try them. Can any of you uh, discuss with us the idea of uptake agreements from your suppliers? Do you find that because in a greenhouse we can make consistent pricing, we're not, we don't have the God factor involved, are there buyers receptive to a flat price all year round, or do they still want to buy when the competition comes out from the field? Do they want to buy at the cheap price there and then pay more for out of season? And are there uptake agreements that you have been able to get that would help us finance our operations by showing that we had customers? Um, I mean, certainly there, it, it's very customer dependent and, and there are those, uh, it's, with, within the, the, the produce business, you, you've got a market that fluctuates and price fluctuates. So there are those retailers and, and outlets who specifically, they want to take that unknown out and they're willing to commit. Uh, generally, it's, a, it's a, in a, a winter and a summer, summer pricing structure and uh, I mean a, a, a very, very large customer being Costco is one who, who does, does operate on, on that, that basis and, and for Howlings uh, specifically, that provides us with, with a lot of certainty to, uh, to, to plan and, and to crop plan because you know while we while we grow tomatoes, uh, we we have you know upwards of, of sixty varieties of tomatoes within within our greenhouse greenhouse facility. So it's it's incredibly important to have those customers that can can play on the uh, or not not play excuse me can plan plan out on contract contract pricing and um, to use another example. Uh, of Safeway in in California, they will uh, for specific programs in in the summertime. For example, uh, we do a locally grown California grown deal with them, and they will they will book out a portion of their business, but they're not willing to to book out 100% of their business because they want that flexibility to when the market's low to buy more. Um, so you, it, I I would encourage any operation out there to find those customers that will, that will do it. And, and I think there's a, a lot of traditional produce people that I've, that I've come across in this, this industry where they, they don't like contract pricing because they, they love the thrill of when the, <laughs> when, when the market's good, it, it's great. Uh, I think often they forget that when the market's bad, it's horrible. <laughs> and, and so, Find that find that balance. I mean, you don't want to you don't want to sit sit there and look at your product going out the door at five dollars less than than your competitor down the street. But uh, it sure feels good when it's five dollars more than your competitor down the street. So, what is the level of risk you're willing to willing to take on? Daryl, do you want to? Can you add anything um, when you look at the different outlets? Maybe broker versus retailer versus yeah. farmers market. Yeah. I, first, first, I got to say that the, the, you got to understand the difference in the scale of their their operation and mine is tr is a magnitude, tremendous difference. So, um, we find in a, in a uh, operation of my size that contracts are really difficult to come by. Uh, very few people want to enter into them for one reason or another, and they frankly don't have to. Um, so that's difficult. Um, the other thing that, that's worth noting for us, and it's just a, a business decision, we chose to, as a, as, a, as a marketing advantage for us, to sell the same, sell a product the same price all year round. So that those guys can count on this price in December and in July. They like that. Um, our customers do. Now again, scale dictates that that's maybe not feasible in some of these you know, much bigger companies, but um, we found customers very, very receptive to that and um, um, still, still don't get contracts very often. Over here. Sure. Uh, Jim Garza, Eastern Nevada Food Bank. 
Uh, one of the things we're doing on our market right now, we're working with our UNR co-op extension office. We're collecting data to draft the Nevada 4-H hydroponic program that we're going to upload to the National Council for approval on a national level. No problem. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of the things about youth education. Well, obviously, this is, we have a hydroponic system in our third grade class in Ely right now, and it's very exciting. But um, a couple of things I wanted to add is water quality. In our market, we have an infestation of juniper. It's a family of the cedar tree. And Daryl, you guys have Texas cedar. I'm from Austin, Texas, so I know. We this can... is what we're going to teach our kids. Hydroponics can work. We're going to try to cut costs. We're going to try to make it conventional using natural resources. And this is two of the areas that we're going to target out of probably 20. We're going to take the juniper tree, we're going to debark it, and we're going to lay it underneath each row. And the natural gas that's going to be released from cedar, we're hoping will take care of our pesticide problems in our greenhouse. So you guys ought to try that in Texas with the Texas cedar. We're also going to burn the cedar. Biochar is a new thing that's coming up. It's porous. It has no mineral content. And after we run the water through our system, it's a closed system, we're going to filter it through biochar and see if it'll take out all the nutrients, that excess nutrients that weren't utilized. Again, take the cedar there in Texas, do the same thing. Maybe that's your answer to your water quality issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Sounds very interesting. Over here. Thank you. Thank you, Sage Stark, for starting this uh, conversation in our state. I think it's about time we take advantage of our uh, resources here in Nevada. Uh, my question is, uh, about tilapia, and maybe John Toth already know about this. Hi, John. Uh, it's banned in Nevada. And how, I mean, people from Asian descent and also from the Middle East, and I've been approached, they want to buy the fish right off the water and into the pan. And I'd like to know how do we go about, uh, why do they have to ban tilapia in, in Nevada? There's no hardly any water in Nevada. And uh, how do we go about, go about uh, Getting that, uh, getting to raise tilapia. Maybe there's somebody already raising tilapia in Nevada. Can you give me some answers to that? Thank you. Okay. I think one of the things you need to do is start a conversation with your fish and wildlife, your local representative. Are you from this area or are you from another, from down here? From Reno. Reno. From Reno, okay. Well, Fish and Wildlife, Nevada Division of Wildlife are, are some people that you need to start a discussion with. And part of what we're finding is innovative technology in Nevada is sometimes hard to introduce initially. It takes a lot of education um, and outreach. For example, the f my very first project in Nye County, Nevada, was trying to introduce brownfields. And we were told that brownfields don't exist in the rural communities because nothing's ever, you know, you're, you're talking Detroit, you're talking Chicago, you know, things like that don't happen here. Until we found 27 sites, in a fairly short time frame, and we were able to demonstrate the, the benefit of the program. But it took some convincing. I would say it took three to four years before people started accepting it, accepting the concept, and maybe exploring it a little bit further. Um, that was in 2002. In 2012, we applied for a five-county regional economic development, or excuse me, five-county brownfield coalition grant, and were successful. In fact, we were so successful, we were able to incorporate Esmeralda, Nye, Lincoln, White Pine, and Inyo County in California, the first time it had ever been done in the country. So I would say you may have some roadblocks initially in talking to Fish and Wildlife. You may have to go through an education process because maybe they just don't understand the process that you're planning on using. And it may be a matter of changing the legislation if, or the, the local regulation. But you know what? It's doable. But you have to demonstrate that you can preserve the environment, that you're not going to allow the fish to go free and eat other fish and, you know, all the stuff they're concerned about. You have to understand their concerns, and you won't understand that until you talk to them. Thank you. Um, that's really the main reason I kind of got stuck where I'm at, because I don't want to go about the red tape of working with the government officials and I, with this uh, project. So anyway, thank you very much for your answer. Can you uh, answer that question directly? Okay. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Precedent has been set for tilapia to be grown here. It's, it was done here roughly three months ago with Mr. Um, Show. Sh uh, forget his name, but bottom line, it's done. 
If she wants to grow tilapia, precedent has been set. Very good. Hi. Over here. My name is uh, Paul. I'm a UC Berkeley undergraduate, and my question has to do with uh, higher education. Um, what is the role that higher education has in this industry, and what fields of studies do you guys recommend for understanding this field um, better? And uh, is higher education even necessary if I, I wish to have pursued this before um, going into a heavy debt? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone on our panel actually have a higher education degree in horticulture? Actually, I have a biologist who would, or excuse me, a botanist, um, that would argue that yes, higher education is a really good idea. In fact, our company has worked very closely with university on multiple projects. Um, and so as a private industry, from the private industry side, I want to work with people like you. I want to find people who are interested in this type of technology because you, even though you may not be working in a greenhouse per se, if, if you were to come with me, actually I have an intern from UC Berkeley. She comes in in the summertime and works for me and then in the wintertime over Christmas. And one of the things I find of value is she gets latest, greatest information that I can use in projects that I'm working on right now. And in fact, she'll tie me in with, oh, did you know there's a professor over at UNR that's working on this? In, in some cases, it's geothermal or... In fact, we're already, and I'm not so sure, is Nicola here, that I'm supposed to mention that we're also looking at trying to help sustainability within rural communities by containerizing things like greenhouses so that where you have a food desert, we can actually bring that into that rural community. And even if it's more expensive, a lot of these rural community people need something to do. The wives of the miners or you know, they're looking for something that's that's um, safe for their children because in a lot of these communities you cannot, you can't grow things out of the wine tailings that they live on. All right, so if we're able to compartmentalize it and make it into a, a hydroponics project where you can control the environment, the inputs and the outputs, um, the rural communities benefit from things like that. So yes, absolutely, if we don't learn from higher education and start incorporating that information into real world applications that benefit people at the local level, I think we're sorely missing, missing the boat. I'm gonna say earlier, Paul mentioned, and I know I've spoken with Daryl about this and David about this, there's a lot of opportunity for growers, quality growers, who can learn the systems that maybe the larger farms are using or adapt to the systems that the smaller farms are using, currently there's a lot of opportunity. So I'm not sure that the degree matters right now because the industry is kind of in its infancy, but there are a lot of people looking to hire growers. But, but plant science is, is always something that I would like to have. I mean, I think you guys should all go work for these guys and then write a blog to help us little guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One more question. Thank you. My name is uh, Justin Lubin, and I'm with Aqua Green International, and our business is uh, zero discharge saltwater recirculating aquaculture systems. And my question is about CHP, and if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to CHP, what the capital costs were involved in some of uh, the uh, cost benefit analysis, what you, what you ended up, or what you're projecting that you're going to save with that installation, and uh, whether you bought it yourself or used a third party to uh, bring the facility in and that they sold you the power? Just wondering your structure of that deal. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll give you as, as much as I can. I, um, certainly the, the industry in Holland provided the, the landscape and, and the picture to show us what, what the capabilities of CHP are. Uh, we, we worked with an organization in the United States uh, called Western Energy Systems. Uh, they're a division of Pen Power. Uh, they are the, the specific distributor for DE Jambacher uh, gas engines. And um, it's, it's tough to say the, the investment. And I mean, the biggest challenge that we had, our, our installation was, uh, and, and I, I believe remains, the, the only US installation of a, of a CHP uh, gas engine in a, in a greenhouse in the United States. There, there is one in. Uh, in Canada, but uh, the, we, we can, I can't speak to the, the return and, and the investment because honestly the investment is still happening and until we're able to export the power. That is where, uh, where the business plan of, of, of that capital project 
uh, lives and dies is your ability to export power, power to the grid. And uh, fortunately, come this come this June, I, I believe that is all taken care of, and we we will have that capability, and and we'll be able to see what that return on return on investment is. But I mean, certainly, the initial investment is is significant, and uh, uh, specifically Casey Howling, he he saw this in Holland. He believes in it. He wants to be, uh, and wants his business to be to, to be a, be a, and continue to be a leader within this industry and a good corporate citizen. And uh, you know, following following that that trajectory and that path of sustainability, because uh, he's a he's a forward looking person and sees it. If we don't set our path on sustainability. Uh, just from a global perspective, we're, we're all in trouble. So um, looking back within our business, um, we're, we're going to get there and, and try and get there first. All right. Well, that wraps up this panel discussion. Um, everybody thank Eileen, David, and Daryl. And uh, thank you. <laughs>